Welcome back to the 21 Convention. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch as much as I did. Our next speaker up, he's uh, huge in the uh, paleo diet blogging uh, and ex uh, as well as nutrition. Uh, he runs his own website, freetheanimal.com. I'd like for you to check it out as soon as you get a chance. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Richard Nikolai to the stage. Thanks, man. How's everyone doing? Everybody having a good time? This convention is... Uh, any, uh, any um, ideal man out there yet? Or is it a process? We're all ideal. That's why they do these things, huh? It's a process. It never ends, right? So, my, like he said, my blog is freetheanimal.com. And if I ask you, if I ask you um, how many of yourselves uh, regard yourselves as an animal, a human animal, um, like on the prowl for a pickup or maybe even in the bedroom, you know, Bonus points if you're uh, told uh, you're an animal. But do you take it fully? Do you take it fully to heart in all of its facets, in everything you do, in society, in, your, in other relationships, in, in business, the way you interact with people? Um, <clears throat> do you literally or figurative, for example, do you literally or figuratively, you know, confess your sins to some big guy in the sky? Do you feel guilty and shame about yourself as a human being by your very nature? Do you, for instance, um, you know, wring your hands and um, agitate and look forward to stepping into that booth so you can vote your one in 300 millionth say in your own affairs? Are you anxious, concerned? Do you argue with other people about who should rule you next? Do you eat like a human garbage can? In your waking hours, can you go more than two or three hours without putting something down your face? I came to give you a perspective on being a human animal in all of those things I just talked about. And in my looking at, you know, kind of, I didn't know much about the 21 convention and I, you know, did my research on it, looked at some of the videos and I see that there's, that how it kind of originally started and I actually interviewed Anthony way uh, back. There's a, I think, video on his website as well as mine. And uh, you can, see that the way it was formed originally has become different. Now you have things like money management and, you know, entrepreneurship and all of these other aspects other than just man-woman relationships. And so I'm here to kind of expand that, hopefully expand that a little bit more, give you some more things to think about, about how you can carry this kind of rational, being the ideal man uh, to other areas of your life other than just what's already been covered. So hopefully, hopefully I'll touch on some new ground. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so I'm here to talk about diet and, and, and generally stated individualism. Um, but I want to do it from a framework um, that unites these topics and gets into some things like I, like I mentioned in these questions about, you know, a little bit of religion, philosophy, social interaction, social philosophy, um, politics, government, the state. Um, so a good way to look at this is that most of you out there are, you know, young 20s, I see. And so this is a good time because you have an opportunity to avoid some of the mistakes that I made. And I didn't make them all, but I made a, f I made a few of them. And so uh, it's a good time now so that you don't end up, you know, becoming some, if you want, it's your choice. I mean, you can always, you know, get married, have two and a half kids, become a Democrat or Republican, go vote, go to church, do all these things. If that's the life you want, you're welcome to it. But I don't think it's a life fit for an animal. I don't think it's a life fit for a free animal. And I'm going to uh, talk about that. 
So, um, I'd like you to consider that if you are this human animal I talk about, what, how, is, how is that constructed in society and your life today? I like to use the phrase zoo human or human zoo. See, I don't, I don't consider, I don't consider the, the society in which we live anything like what you might term as a, a wild human animal. And by, and by wild, I don't mean, uh, you know, out there, um, uh, you know, using other people to your, to your means or using force or anything like that. I'm just talking about living naturally. So, so I think there's, a, there, there's this concept of this human zoo and that we're actually more domesticated as animals than we are um, free animals. So. Now, who am I and why am I here? Uh, he, he talked about the blog. I want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, and, and I also noticed, uh, you know, I actually considered, um, you know, doing a whole different speech altogether once I saw all the people in Vibrams uh, here this, this morning. So I thought I'd talk to you for an hour about uh, just going to the next step and just going barefoot. So you're welcome to join me, by the way. Uh, I do a lot of barefoot. I used to. I have vibrams, but I uh, I uh, actually do a lot of a lot of barefoot walking. I walk a, pretty much every day. I walk the dogs around the neighborhood barefoot, so you know people see me walking around and it's like, whoa, it's crazy. So uh, so principally, the reason I'm here is because I used to weigh like about 240 pounds. That was uh, 60 pounds ago. Um, there are, I, I emailed Anthony about three photos of what I, what I looked like in that sorry state about four or five years ago. And um, so they'll be on a computer if you want to ask Anthony, or you can go to my website, freetheanimal.com, and on the right sidebar, there's a picture, and it's, there's a link to latest uh, photo, and it's a whole series of posts about you know, the progress of losing weight along the, along the way. So you could check that out if you want to. So that's my, you know, claim to, to fame, I guess you could say. Uh, so it was sure, it was, it was that whole thing. I, you know, I got fat, of course, because of not managing my diet properly. But it was really more than that, because why would you allow yourself to get that way? You know? Sure, it's the food, but that's not the that's not really the fundamental cause. That's not what it's work. It's something dysfunctional in the way you think, because you don't see fat animals in the wild, do you? Do you? How often have you seen a fat animal in the wild, unless they're designed to be that way? Maybe such as, such, <laughs> well. Yeah, it's, 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 that's the way it is by nature. You don't see any skinny hippopotamus. <laughs> see, there's no, they're all the same, right? Uh, you have a, a bear gets fat, and then he goes to sleep for five months, you know? So, you know, if humans hibernated, I suppose it would be appropriate to get into the state that I got in, and, and many people do. And what's really important to consider at your age, those of you who are young 20s, is that you can, most of you can get away with it now. You can get away with eating garbage and crap, and it doesn't start catching up with you. You know, when I was, when I was young 20s, I'd eat what I want, you know? Pizza, beer, fast food, whatever. Of course, it's gotten worse because it's so intensely marketed right now. I'll get into that a little bit more. But, uh, <clears throat> So just a little bit of background on me. I had a uh, religious upbringing from about the age of 10. My parents found the whole fundamental born again thing. Got put into a small private school, um, you know, religious oriented. Then went off to, went off to college um, at a place in Tennessee, a religious school, Bible school. Um, and that was for a year, and then that, that's the, at, at the age of about 19-ish, I guess. Uh, 
due to some experiences there, I started to wise up a little bit and started to, so I left there, went into a state school, um, you know, studied math and science and, and computers and, and business and stuff. And then when I graduated in 84, I went off and lived and worked in Japan for five years. I worked there until 80, end of 89. That was quite an experience. And um, then I went from there and lived in France and worked in France for two years. And um, then I came back to the US in 92, um, deciding to be an entrepreneur and, and start my own company. And over the next year and a half, uh, I got a whole nother e education about business by, by uh, st starting and failing and not one, not two, but three businesses. And the fourth time, it worked. And it worked very fast. And it worked so fast that you know this really works. That's in 92. I, I built that company to as many as 30 employees. It's, and it's still around. I haven't been involved in the day-to-day -day operations for a number of years, um, but it's still going. And you know, uh, when those, when the, when the, when I could no longer, you know, when, when I got older, you know, into my mid-thirties, I suppose, is about when it's when the when the uh, things started to change in terms of of metabolism or you know how your body responds to non-optimal food, I started to pour on the, the pounds, you know. And uh, then it was about uh, five years ago, I'm I turned 50 in January. Do I look it? <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I uh, at the age of 45, I said, man, I wasn't even weighing myself at that point. And uh, so it was, I know it was over 240. That's the last number I remember. Um, and I've, I've, I've taken off about 60 pounds. You know, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. I could probably shed a few more, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not important how absolutely lean you are. What's important is that you look pretty much normal in your, in your clothes, your clothes fit right. And I, I started blogging about it. I, um, I uh, already blogged, I blogged since 2003 um, on these sorts of political and social and philosophical issues. And so I started doing, I started adding to that the, you know, blogging about what I was doing in terms of diet and fitness and so on. And just, you know, because of my style, I guess, uh, um, I, I went from having, you know, a, a couple thousand readers to where, you know, I get you know 100, 50, 100 to 150,000 visits a month, 200 to 300,000 page views. So it's pretty, uh, it's 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 gone it's gone quite a ways. And for the last couple of years, I've done done the diet and and fitness pretty much exclusively with occasional forays into into other things, you know, personal things and so and some of the social things. So uh, speaking at the introduction about free the animal, we talked about. Uh, how we live in a zoo, how I see humanity now as a mass of domesticated animals. Kind of, you ever heard of a CAFO, con uh, concentrated animal feeding operation? You know, where they bring the cattle in after they've been roaming on the grass for most of their life, and in the last, I don't know, a few months or so of their existence, they fatten them up. They put them all together feed them crap, and they fatten them all up. That is, to me, uh, such, a, um, such a metaphor for, uh, for how I view much of what goes on in, um, in society nowadays. Um, but you know what? The cool thing is, you don't have to eat unnaturally. You don't have to move unnaturally. You don't have to sit on your ass all day long in front of a computer. I, I do. Yes, you don't. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, just an aside on that, I would recommend that everybody get themselves a stand-up desk. 
You don't have to do all of your work standing up, but if you, if you do writing or working on the computer and stuff, I think you will be amazed at how it increases your productivity and how, how it makes you think differently. Sitting there going like this all day long is just not natural. Uh, you don't have to have unnatural relationships with women, and I know uh, you all know a lot about that, probably more than I do, actually, because it, it, at least in terms of what the 21 Convention is all about. And <clears throat> you don't have to worship mind-created fantasies either. You know, you can, you can, but you don't have to. You don't have to regard the state and government or politicians with anything but utter contempt. You don't have to. You can if you want, but you don't have to. So if you, if you think of it in terms of being an animal, why would you do anything, any of these things unnaturally? You know, why would you eat unnaturally? Why would you have unnatural relationships, relationships that aren't appropriate, relationships that you didn't evolve over eons of time through natural selection and social orders, voluntary social orders? We are social animals. But by social animal, when you think of, when you think of humans as a social animal, I, I like to use, I like to say that, that, that Humans evolved to account for the values and actions of about six, 30 to 60 other people. And when you have a group of 30 to 60 other people, every member of that group has a real potential of influencing the behavior of every other group. We did not evolve to live in, a, in, in, a, in essentially the equivalent of an anthill or a beehive with a queen or a king ruling us and to whom we sacrifice our lives for. I think I got my... Just a quick second here. Sorry, I got my page out of order. Okay. So let's get into the, let's get into the um, diet and the, the diet part. It really comes down to something as simple as a concept of eating real food. You all know it. You all recognize it. So you can call it the, the uh, paleo diet, the primal diet, caveman diet. I think Mark Sisson spoke here last uh, Last year, if you were here, he went through his whole thing. And, and what's really good ab about, and I advocate Mark's, uh, Mark is a friend of mine, I advocate his approach. R not, only, not only his specific recommendations, but also he has this thing he calls the 80-20 rule. So, you know, we, I'm, I'm not an advocate of, of, of any sort of religion and particularly dietary religion. So this is, take these things as, ver as tools you can use. It's not, something, it's not something that you have to be dogmatic and religious about. You can be flexible about it. But I tell you what, if you get to 80% of what I'm talking about, <clears throat> if you do already have a problem with weight management, it will make an amazing improvement and it will do it fast. If you don't, then you never will. And why would you want to get there and have to do, go through what I did? So basically, let's cover what not to eat. Uh, a great start is grain products. Um, grains, grains weren't really in our diet until the uh, um, um, advent of agriculture, and the very simple reason why is that it's, an, it's, not, a, it's not a nutrient dense food, and it would have taken way too much labor and effort to gather them until there was some sort of being able to cultivate these in, in lots and, and farm them, right? So, no grains, no, and, 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 and 
pretty much everything has grains in it. All the, all, the process, all, the, all the crap in a box, all the crap in a bag, all that stuff down, all those aisles, those cereal boxes and everything, pretty much all of them are, are grain-based and sugar-based. So that's the other thing is, you know, sh sugar. And most particularly, drinking calories, you know, these sugar drinks. Um, it's, it's, it's an enormous load on your system and it will, over time for most people, and you just look around now at, at what's, what's going on, you know. I was thinking about it the other day. I was at, I just joined this club, a uh, swim and racket club over in uh, Los Gatos, California, which is kind of a upscale area, you know. And, um, it, you know, three swimming pools, 13 tennis courts, nice workout room and everything. And I was over there just a couple days ago, lounging around getting some vitamin D naturally. And I was just looking around, I'm like, there is only, I can only, I could only point to one single woman who should have been subject to a law against wearing a bikini. Yeah, I, I do, I do think there's some laws are appropriate. Only one, and I'm like, man, this is like, this is like I remember it back in the 80s because you just don't see that hardly anywhere anymore. You know, you go around, you look through the malls and you're like, my God, what has happened? It's insane. So no grains, no sugar, processed foods, crap in a ba bag. That's the don't eat. That's the stay away from. What, what, so let's do the other side of it. What do you eat then? Well, I, like I always say, meat, fish, fowl, vegetables, and fruit. Meat, fish, fowl, vegetable, fruit. If you, if, you, if you tolerate dairy, a little bit of that's fine. You know, nuts, fine. I, 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 nuts are pretty calorie dense. I, I tend to, to limit them, you know. I, I don't, I, I try not to eat too much cheese or nuts. Um, a lot of people blow their progress with that. But, you know, some of it's fine. <clears throat> and guys, I cannot emphasize this enough. Learn how to be a competent, good cook. And I don't just mean grilling burgers and steaks. This will not only impress a woman, but you'll be proud of yourself as well if you do it right, do some sophisticated stuff. And, and pride is a virtue, by the way in my book, in my world. So just really, you know, if you don't already, if you can't already, if you go to my blog, for example, freetheanimal.com, and look at the category called food porn, you'll see what I mean. I, I, there's, you know, I'm not the best cook in the world, but I do pretty good. And I put a lot of photos up. I don't really go into detailed recipes because I don't cook that way. I just, I do stuff, you know, and I, it's just over experience over the time because in my household uh, between my wife and I, I'm the cook. I always have been just because I've always cooked. I was, I was on my own for so many years and, um, and uh, I, I did a lot of cooking. And so I just really encourage you that's the, so, so that we've gone over what don't eat, what do eat, but also you got to learn to cook. You got to be able to cook and impress yourself be proud of it. You'll impress other people. It'll be, may, it'll really help your progress along, right? So you don't it's, get uh, lazy. <laughs> and then the other thing is that, you know, the in, in terms of of this whole progression, um, part of part of the uh, don't 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 be the the kind of guy who you know goes out and spends a, a lot of a nice a lot of money on a nice car. You spend a lot of money on a nice car. You go and get yourself some nice expensive clothes and shoes, maybe a really expensive watch. And you get in your car and the place you visit most frequently is some drive through of a fast food restaurant. Does that make any sense? Spending all this money on all these 
nice things to go on your body and around your body, and then you use it to go put crap in your body. Doesn't make any sense. Or you go, have a, you go get yourself a nice bachelor pad, and the most frequent visitor is the pizza delivery guy. You know? How about, you know, grocery delivery and you cook your own food? Much better strategy. Um, there's a, there's a, the, you, some of you who might know something about the paleo, primal, evolutionary diet might have, uh, might have certain assumptions about carbohydrate level. And because we say, you know, eliminate the grains, sugars and stuff, that's cutting out mostly carbohydrates. So it seems like intuitively it's a low carbohydrate diet. And so that's why when you tell people that, you know, I don't eat bread and I don't eat pasta, um, they'll say, oh, it's Atkins, you know, the, the, you know, the famous low carbohydrate diet. Well, you know, uh, admittedly, Admittedly, most of my weight loss was on a, on a low and very low carbohydrate path that way. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's absolutely necessary for everybody. It's, a, it's highly an individual thing I found over time because I have so many readers and different people have, uh, have piped in and many of them uh, you know, eat potatoes. Some, some, I eat potatoes, yams, things like that squashes and even even one one grain probably if in terms of grains the one grain that's probably the most innocuous is plain old white rice it's just basically glucose and not brown rice because brown rice the, all the bad stuff is in the brand lectins phytic acid phytic acid uh, inhibits not only the absorption of minerals in the rice but anything else that you're eating with minerals. So you want to stay around, away from the brown if you eat some rice. But <clears throat> we're still talking moderate carb because even if you were to eat three cups of rice, a cup with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're still only at 130 grams of carbohydrate. You know, you eat a couple potatoes a day, you're still in that 100 to 150 uh, gram a day range. You know, and I think I'm not. I'm not, I'm not certain, but I think the average carb consumption in the U.S. is somewhere around 350, 400 grams a day, which is quite a lot. So it's not necessarily low carb. It's either low carb or moderate carb, pretty much. Um, there, are, there, are, uh, there are populations like uh, um, the Catavans, for example, which is a population of hunter-gatherers who have very high levels of carbohydrates, you know, but they've never eaten a french fry in their life, never eaten a slice of pizza, never eaten a burger, you know. So they eat tubers, grains, stuff, a little bit of, little bit of protein from fish. Works for them. They're very lean, have great blood work. So it's not, it's not black and white on this issue, but here in America, protect, particularly if you're 80, 20 and you're, you know, you, you, you do, you know, have your, your little treats and junk every now and then. You know, you might want to think about keeping the carbohydrate pretty, pretty reasonable, you know, 50 to 150. And, and you got to find out what works for you individually, you know. If, and if, you're, if, you don't, if you're young and you don't have any of these weight issues yet, then you probably, if you're eating real food almost all the time, you probably, have, you probably have no issue with it whatsoever. Okay, so let's talk about some myths about going hungry. Um, never skip breakfast. Heard that one? You hear it all the time. Nutritionists, right? Never skip breakfast. Which I always, makes me ask, what? So I'm supposed to eat when I'm not hungry? I don't know, maybe you're always hungry at breakfast. I'm not. And I'll tell you why I'm not in a little bit. Keep your metabolism running high. It's bullshit. Even if you, even if you do 
even in mass overeating experiments where they've had people eat for a month at t double their caloric, uh, their normal caloric intake, doesn't increase their metabolism at all, right? Eat six small meals per day. Same basic thing. It, all you're doing then, all you're doing then is never letting your blood glucose come down, you know, very much. You're training yourself to as soon as, as soon as you get a little bit of a drop in blood glucose, eat again, eat again. So you're constantly like this, constantly like this, you know, just pounding your blood glucose all the time and the insulin response. <clears throat> Don't go on a starvation diet. Well, you know, last I checked, last I checked, animals who are predatory, who hunt, uh, don't hunt on full bellies. Do they, do they go eat and then say, okay, time to go hunt. Go, oh, we better eat before we go out and hunt. No, they hunt as a response to hunger because they don't eat all the time. I have two small dogs and they have four, one is, one just turned six and the other is 12. And uh, terrier dogs. And um, for the last at least five years, they have been on a grain-free diet that's sometimes partially raw food and sometimes a, a, um, a product called Evo that's no grains and very, and very high protein. So it's, it's more appropriate to the physiology of a carnivore. And as soon as we started feeding them like this, we noticed something very interesting. They started eating a lot less. And, and sometimes, you know, you think, okay, they get fed in the morning, they get fed in the evening. They don't think that way. Because they don't eat when they're not hungry, you know? So you lay down the bowl of food, they'll take two bites, walk away, they won't take a bite at all. Or they'll eat it down and then try to get at the others before they, before they eat it. So it's very, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very variable, intermittent sort of eating and fasting that's in response to hun hunger and a natural physiology. So um, <clears throat> do you, how many know, who, uh, know what glycogen is? You know, it's, a, it's, the, it's the way that carbohydrate is stored. It gets stored in your muscles, it gets stored in your liver. Under conditions of like extreme exercise, you have a few hours at most worth of glycogen reserves. It doesn't get depleted uh, uh, entirely, but enough of it gets depleted to where your body naturally goes to fat burning. They, you may have heard of hitting the wall, you know, for runners or cyclists. And, and stuff like that. And that's, that's that point at which your body has to shift from burning, uh, accessing glycogen stores into burning fat. Well, so you have a, a few hours of this left, but how many, did you know that the average person has three months worth of energy from their own fat stores? Three months, if you, almost everybody and, and could just, do nothing but drink water for the next three months, and you wouldn't really harm yourself at all. You'd lose a little bit of uh, a little bit of lean tissue. And incidentally, the record I think was set back in um, the 60s or 70s under a doctor's supervision, with only water <coughs> and supplemental vitamins and minerals. Guy who weighed over 400 pounds went a, a year and two weeks without anything else a year and two weeks. That's how powerful of an energy source fat is. He lost over 200 pounds. That's the record. You know. So I, uh, I started uh, what we call intermittent fasting um, very shortly after, the, uh, after I uh, started this whole process. And there's, there's various ways to do it. Um, mine was a 24 to 30 hour uh, water only um, that I did one or once to twice a week. Normally, normally twice, sometimes once. And then I would always work out, do my workout. I did two workouts a week, about a half an hour, intensity stuff. You know, like Doug McGuff talked about last year, and Skylar Tanner and Keith Norris 
talked about today. Um, and I would always work out like about, you know, anywhere from 20 to 26 hours, you know, 20 hours in if I was a 24 hour fast, you know, 26 hours in if I was a 30 hour fast, and then I would eat. And uh, so I got in the habit then of I, I, I can't do a workout if, if I've eaten within like at least six or eight hours. It just doesn't feel right, you know. Again, do animals hunt? I mean, so the workout simulates the kind of natural sort of movement that you would do out in nature if you had to hunt for your own food. You'd be doing that on an empty stomach. So you can actually get used to, to, to doing very intense exercise with heavy weight resistance training, which I recommend, um, on a, on a, on, without having eaten in 24. I've even done it as much as 30, uh, you know, worked out at 36 hour point, you know. And it's very, very interesting how you can play with it because you're, by that time you're, you're well into fat burning. So you're having to burn fat to fuel your muscles and everything. So w when you do some of the bigger moves, like leg movements with your big muscles and lift heavy weights, you can actually do it in, in a way that will make, that will all of a sudden you'll just feel yourself get really hungry, you know? And then you back off on the intensity and 30 seconds later the hunger goes away. Then you go intense again and it brings it back and goes away. You play with that and then you start to, you start to realize how hunger works with your, with your body. It's very enlightening. And almost nobody gets any experience like that because people are feeding their faces all the time, you know, three times a day. Uh, don't go, it's a starvation diet if you don't do it. Now, that said, when you're not fasting, you should be eating good. You should be, you should be eating hefty, you know? It's like just if you were out in the wild and you killed that deer and you don't have a refrigerator or anything, you know, you're gonna chow down. So don't, don't think that it, you don't want to get into a chronic state with it. So another fasting strategy is uh, the eating window strategy. So that can, that's typically like eight hours eating, not constantly, uh, two or three meals in that eight hours, and then 16 hours off. I, I've done that for a while. Uh, just went back to the old way. I like it better, actually. Um, but this, was some, this is something you would do every day. So for example, you eat, you eat your first meal at noon, stop eating at eight in the evening, don't eat again till noon. It's very easy to do once you've done it a couple times. So you could try either way you li you'd like, you know, and <clears throat> it's everybody can do it because everybody had to do it. We evolved having periods of time where we didn't eat. It's just that we're so conditioned to, you know, really deplore hunger and think as soon as you get hungry, I got to eat. I got to eat. You don't. It's nice to be hungry. Now there's some now there's some there's some also some other benefits to fasting. Um, you, how many people have heard of a cleansing diet? It always it always struck me as odd that you would say, "Okay, what should I eat?" to cleanse. Well, the ultimate cleansing diet is to not eat. Because what happens, you cleanse at a cellular level. You, you, all of your cells in your body get little, uh, um, little uh, mitochondrial breakdowns of protein. So when you go into a fast, the first thing your body does is it starts recycling those broken proteins into new proteins. You can Google autophagy. A-U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y, A-O-T-A-O, I <laughs> hope you got that. Autophagy, Google that, you'll see what I mean. Um, there's a, also Google, you know, fasting for, as a, as a uh, therapy for cancer. And it happens in two ways. Cancer cells, unlike normal cells, um, can only feed on glucose. They can't use ketones. Ketones is a byproduct of fat metabolism. So if you are not, uh, if you are not eating, then you're burning fat. You're starving cancer cells. Because two things, they only, uh, they only 
feed, um, feed on glucose, number one. And number two is they're about 30 times less efficient than, um, than normal cells. So they really have to have a lot of glucose. So, you know, you can actually, you can actually find articles on the internet that are named things like sugar feeds cancer and so on. So there's, there's, um, there's been some, some progress in, uh, in, very, in treating various cancers by, by employing fasting as a therapy. Uh, the other method is that, um, interestingly enough, when you, go, when you uh, fast for three to five days in advance of chemotherapy, it puts your cells into, your normal cells, not your cancer cells, into a highly protective, self-protective state. So chemotherapy is like, a, is like a war of attrition, you know. You're just killing cells and you hope you kill the cancer before you kill the, kill the host. Um, but in the, they've done this in rats and they've done it in vitro with human cancer cells and regular cells. And they attain, you attain up to 20 to 20 to 1 kill ratio of cancer cells over regular cells. But it has to be a pretty significant fast. Um, it has to be on the order of three to five days from the research I've read. So that's another thing you can check out on the, on the web. So th there's, there's reason, what I'm getting at is there's reasons why fasting, intermittent fasting, is a good strategy that, ha that has nothing to do with weight loss or weight maintenance. It's more like body weight maintenance because we evolved in a state where we didn't have food at our you know, beck and call 24 seven. So by eating all the time and never giving your system a rest, you know, you're not really living in a natural way. One more thing is your gut bacteria. Uh, you have 10 times as many bacteria in your digestive tract than cells in your body. 10 times. So by fasting, uh, you give your system a chance to rest. You, and there's oftentimes good bacteria and bad bacteria, things like things that cause diarrhea and stuff like that, or just discomfort, you know, heard of irritable bowel syndrome and these sorts of things. So fasting is a good strategy to let those, that bacterial flora readjust to its natural levels, right? So you don't really, I don't think, I don't think you really have to worry about the probiotics and the prebiotics and so on. Just, you know, go a day without eating. A, once a week, once every couple weeks probably would be enough, you know? Everything will even out. Okay, so <clears throat> now, the, uh, now the exercise portion, which is very quick and short. Exercise like Skylar Tanner and Keith Norris told you to do. It's really good stuff. They've both been friends of mine for a long time, and uh, they're just great. They've got some, got some good videos that you can watch on, uh, on uh, Keith Norris's website, so check it out. All right, so that's the diet and uh, diet, nutrition, fasting part of it in terms of your animal nature. So now let's move on to the society stuff. <clears throat> I don't know. I just I don't know why people are so enamored with government. You know, oh, that'd never work. You know, it's it's it's. <laughs> The, the, it, it, it remind, it's, uh, it, it, I see this mass of people with everybody clamoring to live at the expense of everyone else. It's kind of like this big, weird fantasy that, that somehow, uh, you know, you can be guaranteed or assured a life that's not by producing your own values and trading them with other people. You know, everybody's trying to live at the expense of everybody else. It's, it's actually a sophisticated form of a protection racket. If you understand how government got going in the first place. There was no such thing as government back in the hunter-gatherer days. It could not have happened until the advent of agriculture for a very simple reason. There was nothing to steal. 
So envision this. <clears throat> you know, over time, you know, agriculture didn't just happen 10,000 years ago. It was a long process, probably five to 7,000 years of, you know, gradually, you know, cultivating grains and, and, and um, domesticating animals um, to, to be used both for, for, you know, dairy as well as for work in, in um, harvesting grains. So once you, once you now have these plots of land where you're growing grains, you have, you have uh, wealth being generated. You have, you have the grains itself, which, they, which can be stored, and you have the capital that's required to you know, plant and then harvest it and store it. So now there's all of a sudden assets, right? And so some group of, some band of marauders says, hey, I've got an idea, you know? There's these villages cropping up where they're you know, doing all this stuff and they've got all this stuff and they've got food got animals, you know, we can just, you know, ride from one to the next and, you know, make our living that way, stealing their stuff, you know. We've got force, you know, we're trained, so they do that. But then more and more of these bands of marauders get the same idea, it's a good idea, right? So then what you have is, you know, band of marauders comes up to the village to, 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 uh, steal what they can only to find out that another band had already just been there a while ago. So there's nothing left to steal. So what, what's the natural idea? It's like, well, huh. What if we just stay here and we'll just steal a little bit over time and protect them from the other bands of marauders? That's actually how government got started in the first place, thieves. And it hasn't changed. <laughs> it, you know, I have, I have family members. It's funny, I was telling someone on the plane last night that says, you know, it's, it's so hilarious to me that, you know, you have a guy as president who, is, who has a R after his name, or is it before? I don't know. And, you know, this guy, this Republican, does A, B, and C. Well, it so happens that my wife's side of the family are all liberal Democrats. My side of the family is all conservative Republicans. So when Republican president does A, B, and C, it, it's, it's the worst thing in the world for my wife's side of the family, and my side of the family has every possible reason to justify it. A few years later, you have a guy in office with a D. He does the exact same A, B, and C, and it's reversed. Now it's the worst thing in the world from the perspective of my side of the family, and there's all kinds of reasons to justify it for my wife's side of the family. So, you know, the agitation level that people go through that just waste their lives thinking about this, you know, working, I'm going home every day and, you know, TV, Fox News, CNN, you know, MSNBC, whatever, is it? talking head shows, back and forth, you know, sound bites, talking over each other, arguing endlessly, 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 never getting anywhere, you know, to, to what end? It's just to keep you riled up. I, um, I read a book several years back by a guy named Nicholas, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And it's called Fooled by Randomness. He also wrote another book called The Black Swan. I recommend Fooled by Randomness. Um, it's, uh, he was an options trader. And, um, and he, he, he was, he's made a lot of money. He's one of the guys that, uh, that made a lot of money back, I think, in 87, Black Monday. He was right <laughs> that things were going to collapse, and he made tons. Um, but it, it's basically a book about how, you know, all these little 
events that happen, and it's, part, it's particularly true in the political sphere, where people just get all up in arms all the time, agitated. They think that they know exactly what's going to happen. You know, the sky is falling, this sort of thing, just because of random events. So he proposed, he, he proposed uh, that you do an experiment, and he said it was, it was basically, you know, stop taking in all sources of news. No newspapers, no news magazines, no cable news channels, you know, no talk radio, all this stuff, and see, see if anything happens, you know. Uh, if something is important, an important news event, it'll find its way to you, you know. But this whole idea of being, you know, news junkies every day, news junkie slash political junkie, it just gets you nowhere. It's unnatural. You're better off spending time in your relationships, your education, your knowledge, um, you know, entrepreneurship if you have an idea for a business venture. I don't vote. Not in many, 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 many years. It's pointless. One in 300 million say in your own affairs. What a smoking deal is that? And if you vote, you have no right to complain. Everybody switches that around, right? What, what, that makes no sense. And I've been saying this a long time before George Carlin said it. If you go to YouTube and search George Carlin doesn't vote, it's a very nice three minute rant in there about voting. He doesn't vote either. But it makes no sense. If you vote, you're simply participating in this big game scheme with rules, da 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 da. If it goes crap on you, you have no, would you, do you sit down in a board game when you lose, complain? about the rules? No. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, we played this game. We decided we're going to do this to you. You have every right to complain. So if you want a right to complain, stop voting. It's pointless. It only encourages them. <clears throat> when people ask me why I don't vote, I said, because I'd never do that to you. You know, why do you, what, what interest do you have what interest do you have in going to try and impose your will, your sense of values, on everybody else? What gives you the right to do that? Just because, just because you have a bigger mob than the other guy? That makes it right? Shameful. I don't know about you, but I see myself as morally superior and far more competent than any politician you can name. And you should too. When someone, when they say, they say, you know, that would never work. That would never work. It means, it means that, it means that, man, I don't have, I, it, it won't give me a guarantee. It won't give me an assurance. That's really what they mean. It means that if I somehow can't manage to see to my own values, that it's going to happen anyway. That's what it means. Now, you want to live that way. I guess that's fine. but. Uh, I, prefer, I just prefer to take my chances. Again, wild animal. Is there any assurances, any guarantees? You know, so what? You know? Life is a risk. And, the, and the, sooner, the sooner you start thinking of yourself as an animal in a risky environment, number one, you're going to make better choices. You know, if you're not counting on the social safety net, so on, you know. Someone, someone posed a question, I can't remember whether it was on Facebook or Twitter the other day, and said, you know, 
If you have the right to make me pay for your health care, how come you don't have the right to make me pick your cotton? If you want to be a slave, go ahead. And incidentally, if you individually or if you can gather a group of people together in such as like a charitable you know, group of people and you want to offer guarantees or assurances to other people who might be less fortunate or might have had misfortunes in their lives, I'll tell you something, nobody is going to stop you. Nobody's going to stop you. The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led for, to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Anyone know who wrote that? H.L. Mencken, you've ever heard of him? He's a very acerbic journalist uh, back in the 30s words of wisdom. One more thing about the state. It's only the largest mass murderer in history. Estimates competent. Estimates range from 160 million to over 300 million in the 20th century alone. Google it. Death by government by, I forget his first name, Rommel. It's a, it, the book is actually online. You can read it online. You can see the sources, how it's calculated. <clears throat> guilt and shame, guilt and shame, guilt and shame, guilt and shame. So we've covered the, we've covered the political side of it. You know, you're selfish. You don't want to help the less fortunate. You're just looking out for yourself. I, you know. There's nothing wrong with guilt and shame, you know. I remember when I shoplifted a wallet from a department store when I was six years old and my mom found it in my pocket when she did the laundry. You know, I felt, I felt appropriate guilt and shame. And it motivates you to action. And that action was that the next day she marched me over to the department store where, and where she asked to see the manager. And I had to go into the, his office, explain what I did, and pay for the wallet. Appropriate. Guilt and shame. Guilt and shame, right? <clears throat> but when professional politicians use guilt and shame, you know, you're not sacrificing enough. Everybody needs to give a little more. Everybody's going to have to sacrifice. Or when, you know, representatives of a higher cause use it, it you're guilty by nature. Your very nature, just the way you think, is sinful. Or your physical urges. I guess you know what I'm talking about there. When you, when, you, when you make someone feel guilt and shame inappropriately, by which I mean you are, you are shaming them and guilting them on their own nature as a human animal, that is simply a mechanism for control. If you, and it happens in relationships too, doesn't it? You know, ever been with a woman who found ways to make you feel guilt or shame, but in unearned way, something you did, you didn't do anything wrong. It was just the way you were, or she expected something from you that you didn't have a, uh, that, that she didn't have a right to expect from you. Yes, that's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> there you go. It's happened to everybody. It's, you know, you always, you always, People use guilt and shame to, to, to motivate you to action. And when they motivate you to action, they're controlling you. 
And this happens on all levels of inappropriate authority. Government, religion, various uh, coercive sort of societies. So, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, let me, let me make something clear about the whole religion. I am, I'm an atheist, I have been for 20 years. It was really about, it was really realizing that I didn't have any fear of a supreme being. If I don't have a, any fear over some supreme being, why would I waste my time with it? Makes no sense. It's only if you have fear. My, I, you know, I, I told you about growing up in the fundamentalist thing. Thankfully, in year, years later, you know, it was my parents that were involved with that, my other brothers. So thankfully, over a period of years, I was able to get them completely away from that. And usually, they don't even go to church anymore. But they can never make that next step to say, that's eh, all a bunch of bullshit. Because there's this fear there. It's fear, you know. What can you do? By the same token, I have no problem. I have no problem with a kind of a, a spiritualism or something, if you will, to, for lack of a better term. You know, it's not my cup of tea, but you know, I'm not talking about just some sort of sense of that that there's something special about us and and that we should be charitable and people of goodwill and, and so on. I don't think you need to believe in anything like that to do that. But if that's your if, if that's your thing, you know, and, and there's it's also so wrapped up in, you know, traditions, family traditions and, and things like that. And and if you're gonna raise kids, you know, if it's you know if, if that's what you want to do, but try to stay away from the literalism, you know, like there's some big guy with a white beard in a chair somewhere, or, you know, you know, or there's actually 72 virgins, you know, all these forms of literalism. Just look at it practically. Does it, does it work for you? I mean, when I quit, when I dumped all that stuff and just quit believing it entirely, my life improved immensely and immediately. It, 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 it's kind of just look at it as an exercise in recognizing reality. Cold, hard reality. And when you do that, then you start to make proper decisions in business. You start to make proper decisions in relationships because you're unwilling to fool yourself. You're unwilling to entertain a delusion. Yeah, so to, to, to wrap things up, I, I, I wanted to give, with, without actually knowing that much about the whole pickup community and, and all those things, uh, I wanted to give my you know, free the animal perspective on men, women relationships. <clears throat> and this is, incidentally, one of the things that I actually ended up totally by accident doing right in my 20s. I, uh, my first, you know, serious, uh, you know, sexual relationship was when I was in college. It was long term, it lasted about a year and a half. And in the entire year and a half, it was non-exclusive. Not by my choice, but I learned to accept it. She, had uh, a, uh, a, you know, love of her life thing that was, he was off at college in another state, and he wasn't back very much, you know, I think once or twice the whole year and a half. But when he was, she was with him. And when he wasn't, I was like the physical friend, as she called it. This was before the concept of friends with benefits. Uh, came out, I guess. And it was hard to accept at first, but I grew 
to accept it and believe it to be a more natural way of living. And I went on to do the same thing over and over and over again until I was 35. I had many, many very short-term relationships, but I had three, three other serious long-term relationships, one that spanned seven years over three continents, you know, and she was always with someone else, but we had a relationship. And you know what? I'm really proud of it that I did it that way because I learn to just not be, not worry about exclusivity at all. It really worked out nicely for me. Well, with the exception of the crazy bitch in France, but uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she totaled my uh, 87 Corvette. I was at sea, I was on a ship at sea and she found the keys to my 87 Corvette that I'd shipped over there and uh, totaled it in Aix-en-Provence uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning with another guy in it. So that didn't make me too happy. And that was, I almost, I almost got, that was the one I almost married. So it's, it's, I was fortunate that that happened. Um, so to, to, to make a long story short, I got married for my very first time when I was 40 years old to a woman who was also getting married for her very first time at 41. We'd been together for five years. So, you know, the way it worked out for me is just by happenstance that I ended up being in lots of, uh, a bunch of relationships that I really cherish, but were non-exclusive on either of our parts, you know. Um, and I did that till I was 35, a bunch of smaller relationships, such that by the time I was 35, I was ready to settle down. My, uh, my wife and I have been together now for 15 years, 10 of them married, and it has been exclusive. But I, but I was ready for it at that point in time. I'd gotten all that stuff out of my system. So that's my perspective on it. I don't know whether that's your value, but uh, that's my perspective on it. So that's it. Questions? Would you say you consider yourself an anarchist? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. So then why would you complain about having one in 300 million say? Isn't that better than no say at all? It's just, it's a waste of time. It's, it's uh, in my view, it's simply a waste of time. Why would I? How long it, does it take? It, it doesn't, what? How long does it take? Too much of my time. And it's not just, it's not just going the act of voting. It's participating in the whole process. It, you have to think about it. I don't even think about it. I, I don't care who's running. I don't care what their policies are. It's just, I, I'm way too selfish to, to uh, do that. And plus, I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even try to force you with one in 300 millionth of my say to do what you didn't want to do, but I wanted you to do. It's, it's morally wrong. That, I think voting is immoral. There you have it. Uh, the question would be, or to maybe pinpoint what we're talking about, I think your problem that I'm identifying is that, or your problem with voting is that you hate voting for anything that's not optional. Well, I, actually, I, actually, actually, there is one instance where I, where, where I think voting is appropriate, and that's when it's 100% unanimous. If it's 100% unanimous, nobody's being forced to do anything, right? But there, there, is, there is no... There is, I, I cannot see any moral, ethical resolution to the idea that just because you have a bigger group, a bigger mob, that you get to force other people to do what you want instead of what they want. Curious, would you, are there any presidential candidates running that you would make an exception to this rule for with that exception proving the rule? 
Are there any presidential candidates? I don't know. Well, you know, I mean, uh, certainly there's degrees. I mean, I, I, uh, I, um, I, I was, uh, I was interested to follow Ron Paul's uh, campaign last time and his ability to raise funds, but I knew it would never go anywhere anyway. You know. I have to say, I really agree with a lot of the things you're saying about religion and how I think fundamentalist religions like fundamentalist Christianity or fundamentalist Islam really have a negative effect on many aspects of human life. Mm -hmm. But Angus, but thing I'm wondering is what if say you're interested in certain religious or spiritual tradition? Because I'm interested in Buddhism and Taoism, do you think those philosophies are entirely bad? Because they're not so much about trying to convert I, I, other people. I, I, there, there's, there's some exceptions there. So if they call them in a religion, but it's really different because Buddhism, Taoism, and stuff like that, they don't believe in some supreme being. They don't even, even in, in many cases, in many of these Eastern traditions, don't even believe in an afterlife, you know? And in fact, in, in original Judaism, they didn't believe in an afterlife. You know. Yeah, you're exactly right. The concept of afterlife didn't really appear until the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's it's it's kind of it's, that's why that's why you know I'm I'm speaking very generally, and basically what I'm speaking to is literalism. You know, in other words, in other words, you are taking your life and and spending it on literal beliefs in magical things that have no basis in reality or can be proven, and you're, you're spending your life's capital on it. You're making decisions based on things that, you know, that just aren't true, right? So, but, it's, but in terms of the, of the feel-good part and the community, the family stuff and everything, in, in some of the more liberal kinds of traditions. You know, I went, I recently, uh, a good friend of mine died uh, a few months back, and I went to her, uh, her, um, her and her partner were members of the, uh, of the, uh, what is it, Unitarian Universalist uh, Church. And so we went to, my wife and I went to the, to the service, and I was extremely impressed with how, basically, basically the way the service went is it was it was ancestor worship, which is an interesting concept from from the from the standpoint of the paleo and 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 the way we regard hunter gatherers and and stuff like that. But it was quite interesting. So it was not at all focused on some literal being. It was focused on the ancestors, and and actually the the minister of that church, Nancy, is is also a friend of mine. She lived in our same complex of, of lofts, and I'd spoken with her many times about it, and and she 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 perfectly accepted the fact that I was a non-believer. So I was talking with her after the service, and I said, you know, it's, it was very interesting. I pointed out what I just did to you, and 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 the harpist was there too, and they both smiled and they said, you know what? It's because we just don't know. Now that's something that's something I can I can accept. You know, you you go and you have your thing, but 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 this but this but this rock solid, you know, rock solid certainty about you know certainty and literalism is is where I think it's a problem. Now it's a problem for me. I should point out mostly philosophically, <clears throat> and if if that's not where you are, then what I would say is then look at it practically. How is it working for you? So you could start there and then consider. And then if you say, wow, wow, you know, I'm not, I don't think about this at all. I don't worry about it. You know, I'm, just, I'm pretending as though I don't believe, acting as though I don't. And then you see improvements in your life, then maybe you go the next step. But it's, it, you know, it's not mandatory. That's me. I'm just giving you my perspective on things. With regards to voting, what do you think about the whole notion of lesser of two evils? Uh, I don't, evil is evil, you know. Thanks for pointing it out. Okay, all right, that's all I need. <laughs> I, I try to live pretty principled, pretty principled, a pretty principled life as much as I can. So I'm not big on, I'm not big on 
on utility. You know, I, I even talked to that in, in, my, pre, in my presentation about so people say, well, that'll never work. And my, always my, 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 I, 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 my answer to that is work for whom? Well, that'll never work. Work for whom? Is that it? Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. It's fun. <laughs>